The people leading the Vermont Bioenergy Initiative are forging the connection between diversified agriculture and renewable energy production. These farmers, scientists, and entrepreneurs are at the forefront of a local production for local use movement, and they are proving that local food systems and clean energy production together are economical, compatible, and essential. These are their stories. My name is Sid Bosworth. I'm an agronomist uh, with the University of Vermont. As an agronomist, I primarily have worked with dairy and livestock farmers in their agronomy areas of field crops and forage crops. More recently, I've expanded into uh, research and extension using grasses for combustion and thermal energy. So in this project, I'm evaluating several different species of grasses. Uh, we can break grasses into two major types. The Cool season forages are very similar to what our farmers grow here as a hay crop. The other grasses are some of the warm season grasses from the tall grass prairies. Big blue stem and switchgrass will grow under a pretty wide range of soil type. From my research, I think uh, there are other grasses that look interesting. One that grows in numerous places across Vermont, especially on wetter soil, is reed canary grass. Another grass that we're looking at here that the jury's still out on is uh, Miss Cam giganteus. They're very tall and productive. The biggest benefits of, of these grasses is the fact that they really protect the soil so very little erosion occurs. These grasses also really build up organic matter. You can actually get more carbon put into the soil than what you're taking off for biomass fuel. We're looking at them for marginal soil. They can grow pretty well under a low fertility situation. I don't think these grasses are going to compete with good cropland. It is important to plant at an, op an optimum time, you know, early June in, in, in most of our locations in Vermont. I think the first important step is a good soil test to evaluate the soil for its pH and fertility status. Anytime you take a whole crop off a field, like a hay crop, you're removing a lot of nutrients. And so soil, periodic soil testing and taking care of those needs, whether that be from fertilizer or manure, is going to be a, an important factor. Often with a, a, a small seeded crop like switchgrass, you're going to plow the field. And that's usually followed by harrowing, using a disc harrows to fill the, the field. We want to ultimately end up with a fine, smooth seed bed. So the next implement that I usually would use is something like a spike tooth harrow or a spring tooth harrow, which starts to smooth out the site and more finely till the site. And then if it's too fluffy, follow with some kind of roller, either a, an old brilliant seeder or a, or a dedicated roller to firm up the soil. The actual seeding could be accomplished with a broadcast seeder or a cultipack seeder like a brilliant or a grain drill. If the grain drill has a small seed box, uh, that's a good way to place the seed. The important thing is to plant the seed in a good firm seed bed near the surface and that it be firmed up. These are very small seed just like uh, other hay crop type seed so they should be planted at a fairly shallow depth you know no more than a quarter of an inch deep. Some of the research we've done here and at other states would indicate that a, a good seeding rate is around 10 pounds of what I call pure life seed per acre. Once seeded, uh, it does take about three years to get a full stand of switchgrass that's fully productive. We can use regular hay equipment to harvest these grasses. They're normally only harvested once a year though because you, you to maximize biomass and meet fuel quality characteristics. For the switchgrass big blue stem, we're looking at fall harvest in late September or sometime in October. The more mature the grass is, in other words, fully headed out and mature, usually the lower the ash content. That's why it's important to harvest in autumn versus in the summertime for these grasses. One management strategy is to actually mow the field and let the windrows sit for two or three weeks, let it get rained on, leach out some of the minerals in order to reduce ash. These grasses probably do better if they're cut a little higher, you know, six to eight inches of stubble, put into uh, rows like you'd see hay, put into windrows, 
and once they have dried down to you know at least 18 percent moisture content they could be baled for hay then that's normally stored and they'll lose a little more moisture in storage uh, stable moisture for hay is usually 12 to maybe 15 percent moisture content so it's not really different than you know our normal hay our highest yields were running about three and a half tons of dry matter per acre. We're hoping by the third year that some of our varieties and grasses may get up to five tons. Either round bales or square bales can be used. If you use a round bale, then you need some type of round bale tub grinder to break that up into smaller parts. I think as new technologies come out for the utilization of these, the boilers, as they can accommodate these products, I think we'll see more use. And certainly as fuel costs go up, more, more people are going to really consider alternatives like biofuel. I'm John Bootle and I'm one of the co-founders of Renewable Energy Resources. And Adam and I started the business a couple of years ago. So we started doing our general research and then about two years ago, we actually started producing biomass for schools to burn. Well, you're familiar with bales of grass, and in order to burn a bale of grass, you need to process it. So the simplest form is to chop the grass like this. You can compact grass into pellets, like most people are familiar with wood pellets for pellet stoves. The briquettes, like this, take less energy to make than pellets. They're lower cost, and they burn very efficiently in the big boilers. So what our company is specializing in is the commercial customer, so that's why we opted for the larger um, form factor of the briquettes. Our motto is, is field to flu. So we help with the establishment of grass, the compaction or densification of grass, uh, and to all the way to the boiler. All material that comes in to this machine starts here at the hammer mill. The hammer mill that we use handles round bales up to six feet in diameter, weighing up to about a thousand pounds each, which grinds the material into the inch and inch and a half lengths. In most applications, grinding the grass and densifying the material does a couple of things. One is, is it burns in the boiler in a better manner. Secondly, you can transport it in a cost-effective manner in trucks. As material comes down the cyclone or the cone, comes into the box, it then gets directly fed into an auger, which moves two pistons as this large wheel right here runs centrifugally, which powers the two pistons. We have a standard transmission. What we've done is we've put uh, belts on the back and run jack shafts up to the front side of the engine to create a PTO driven system that we can trailer anywhere we want to go and it's very economical at two gallons an hour. So we create a two inch puck which is created with temperature and pressure from the piston movement. We densify this down to 35 pounds a cubic foot. So as you can see the pucks are roughly a half inch thick. It comes apart for the simple reason of moving through augers. It goes into a storage pit, it gets augered into a boiler, and you want a material that will flex so that you don't clog and break an auger system at a university or a school or wherever you're fueling this. We see ourselves as a complement to the wood industry and providing a valuable, sustainable resource. It's a very community-based business. Like I see, you have the, the grass, the processing and the user all within like a 30 mile radius. So what this does is it helps the farmer make money because they're in contact with the customer. It helps keep money in the local community and sustains the local community. Um, so it's really an engine for helping rural communities. And the thing I like about it is that it is doing good, it's sustainable energy. And when you talk to people and they start begin to understand what the benefits are, people are very enthusiastic about it.